Good morning, everyone. I got one. That was good. Good morning, everyone. I've always wanted to do that. <laughs> I hope everybody had a really great night last night. Not too great. I see some people struggling a little bit this morning, but everybody looks really great in their green. Welcome. We're so excited to have you here. My name is Brittany, and I am from the Carolinas chapter. You, woo, yeah, all right, that's good. We can be excited. Um, we are here today to talk about raising the bar themed events. Um, in the past, you may have heard this described as finest. Um, we've basically taken the approach of looping everything aside from endurance and great strides into one category. So real quick, how many of you at your chapters already have some type of um, like finest or golf or some type of themed event? Okay, good. Most of the room. How many of you are more aspirational when it comes to wanting to start something like that at your chapter? Couple. Okay. Yeah, great. So what we're going to do today is we're going to go into a couple of different um, speakers. We have some really great uh, people up here from different chapters across the country. They're going to talk about some of the elements of those events. And then we're actually going to break out into different groups based on the type of event. So if there's an event that you're doing really well and you want to get ideas from others on, or if there's an event type that you may not have at your chapter that you're interested in, that'll be the time where we're going to break out. We're also going to keep this super informal. We want you guys to feel like you can ask questions um, you know, of the people up here and of myself. If you're watching online, welcome. Feel free to submit questions and we'll make sure we get those answered during the session as well. So today we want you to be able to take a few things away. Um, one of the big part of themed events is sponsorship pitches. So we have a, a couple up here that are going to be talking about that. Um, Mac and Mac, which we're excited about. That's their real names. We didn't make that up. Mac and Mac. Um, and then also we want you guys to know um, how to add fun new elements to existing events that you may already have. And then also take away some event-specific ideas um, based on the types of events that your chapter may have or may want to do. That's me. Cool. I got my name up there. <laughs> All right. So what we just talked about a little bit, what are themed events? Could be a dinner dance. Um, I know my chapter has a really cool event we were just talking about called Fashion Breathes Life. It's a fashion show. Uh, golf events. Maybe you have a fishing event. Uh, your finest and YP events. So really, like I said, we're grouping all of these into that themed events category. So I'm really excited that we have Mac and Mac um, here from our Maryland chapter, and they're going to talk to you guys a little bit about sponsorship and sponsorship sales. Um, not to take away their uh, thunder, but not only are they uh, going out and trying to gather sponsorships, but they are actually sponsors themselves through their business. So really great opportunity. Thank you guys so much for being here. There we go. All right. Uh, so one of the main events that we want to talk about this morning is an event we call Passion for Food and Wine. Uh, we do this in the fall in Baltimore. Uh, we have 17 of the top restaurants uh, in town. And the tactic we took with this event was uh, we, we had limited space in the sense of we could get 17 tables of 10 people there. So we decided, you know what, let's put a premium on the sponsorship. Uh, for anyone that runs an event, you know, you've got to make your money on the sponsorship and then have the right people in the room. So uh, we charge eight to $10,000 a table. Uh, and then we found that that really helps with bringing the right folks in the room because companies look at it as a great opportunity to really entertain clients, uh, significant others. And so it's been really successful from, from that standpoint. Um, Mac and I, by the way, really focused on diversity. We have the same name and we're from the same place. So we really, really knocked it out of the park there. Um, what's fascinating to me about the event that Mac talked about was really the evolution. Uh, it really started a handful of years ago. And uh, you know, Mac wasn't even 30 when he started the, uh, the event. And it's now uh, gross, or excuse me, nets over 300,000 a year just consistently. And uh, Mac got energized because he was one of the finest uh, in the, one of the first years we did that. And he missed his fundraising goal, and he was pissed off. <laughs> and uh, we've, we've forgiven him for missing his uh, finest goal, by the way, after repeated successful years. And, and to Mac's point, uh, it's, it's an event that's now established really in the, the greater Baltimore community as one of those um, must-attend events. Um, if you're sitting at... If you're, you're a guest of somebody who's sponsored or you're a client or a prospective client, 
um, if you will, you're sitting at a table um, where a chef that's, that's well-known in, in the area is actually preparing a, a seven-course meal right in front of you, and it's paired with various wines. Um, so it, you have to work hard not to have a, a great time at, at that event. I think the advantage for those and, and any other themed event, what we found is, you know, it's an experience, uh, which lets us, you know, kind of change the sponsorship strategy. Uh, coming at it from the sponsoring side and walking people through sponsorships, uh, you know, the fact that there is such limited space. Uh, we are in a fortunate position where we're pretty much resold for the next year, the uh, the afternoon after. The morning after is usually a little slow after that night, but the uh, afternoon after we have uh, commitments again. So, uh, But I think it's really an opportunity. We're, we're one of many asks that are going in front of companies, but we have something very different and very special. Uh, and so when we do have occasionally a table come available, it's grabbed pretty quickly by someone who's already been at the event. But, but assuming that you don't have an event that's, that's like that, you know, the, you know, really grabbing those sponsorships is critical. And uh, despite Mac's youthful age, he actually uh, runs one of the larger, um, more prominent CPA firms in, in the Maryland area. And he is approached all the time with very great causes uh, looking for people to sponsor. I run a, a bank region that's basically Maryland, D.C., Northern Virginia, and, and I as well am overwhelmed with the number of requests I get to, to come across my desk asking to sponsor. And it's always interesting the different approaches that we, that we see. Oftentimes somebody will put a very nice package together and drop it in the mail and it will sit in my inbox and uh, whether I open it or not, it's 50-50 uh, at best, unfortunately. Um, and whether somebody follows up with a phone call or not, that's 50-50. And uh, if there's not a hook, then the phone call is a very pleasant exchange, but it typically ends there. Um, so when we're on the other side of that, when we're looking for sponsorships, we really get strategic about how we do that. Yeah, I think like Max said, we, we get a ton of them where they just kind of come in at different sponsorship levels. I actually had someone calling me the other day from another very worthwhile cause in Baltimore, and all they wanted to do was renew. They wanted to make sure we renewed. Uh, and I actually shot her an email back and said, hey, if you have 30 minutes, we actually have three times what uh, we typically do allocated for you this year uh, if you want to talk about it. So she called quickly after that. But, uh, <laughs> you know, it was one of those where you constantly go at it from a, a dollar figure. Uh, but I think talking to these organizations and asking them what all they participate in, something we, we heard yesterday, even in some of the sessions, really getting to know them, it helps. Uh, it certainly means a lot to to me when I get that. And so for, for us to have the opportunity to sit down and learn a little bit more, not just about the event, uh, but you know what all that event contributes in the overall uh, scheme of things is really helpful. It's interesting, last Thursday, before I got settled in the office, this is before 8.30 in the morning, I actually received three different requests for sponsorship. One was somebody who I sort of know in the market that, that is part of another competitor CPA firm. They wanted me to give $5,000 to the American <coughs> Cancer Society. And that came through by email. Um, another, actually, colleague of mine, one of our younger rising stars, one of these folks that you just look at and say, wow, you know, high potential. He actually participates on a junior board of the first T of Baltimore. Um, he had a request. He, he actually wanted to talk later that day about potentially getting involved. And then I had a very important client of mine send me a sponsorship request. Well, you all can guess which one I completely ignored. Right? The first one is easy to put that aside. Now, the American Cancer Society, what a great cause. There's no question about it. Um, I'm actually touched. We're all touched by that. Um, the, the, the rising star within the company Every day, I've got to figure out how to keep that person engaged and how we keep them moving along the career path because any other bank in the country would, would pick this person up in a heartbeat. And if this person's actually investing the time and a cause and I'm not helping to support that, then I, I probably ought to find something else to do. So that was an easy one. And obviously, if I've got a client that's paying the bills, um, we're going to listen to that as well. So... As I think about it from the other side, how do we solicit sponsorships for cystic fibrosis? 
you know, the good news is everybody puts cystic fibrosis up with American Cancer Society in terms of name recognition and cause, which is what this foundation's really done, which is pretty amazing if you think about it. But it's how do we, how do we get that hook? And, you know, the finest is good at finding those young up-and-comers that the CEO or the decision-maker of the company says, <laughs> I, I, I don't have a budget left, but let's scrounge up some, some dollars to support that. And then also, you know, who are, the, who are the CEOs and the decision makers that are in the marketplace that are meaningful to somebody's wallet that would be willing to make a couple of uh, phone calls and, and a couple of in-person visits to, to ask? So, Mac, you said that you actually started the, the food and wine event that you're talking about. So talk to us a little bit about how you got that off the ground. Now you have a bunch of companies that want to participate and want to renew, but that first ask when you had nothing, how did, yeah. that, how did that go? And, and maybe tell us about some, some difficulties that you had with that. Well, I thought we were crazy, to be clear. So uh, we were going <laughs> to... We bring, all did. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Carrie from, ba from Baltimore's chapter sat me down at Starbucks one day to talk about it, and I quickly suggested we move to a bar because we were going to have 17 people cooking in front of everyone in an unfinished space. So uh, it, was, it was a challenge. But... I think what we did really well early on was we established the brand for the event. And, and that's something that today matters so much And from the marketing side when I look at things. And what we've done really well is, you know, passion is just kind of, it's known throughout town now. And so uh, when we sat down with people, you know, we, we told them about the concept and you got the head turn and it was kind of interesting. And so what we've done really well is we've been, uh, the folks that have been loyal to us, you know, I think... We probably had seven people in the first year that have been back with us every year, and they've doubled you know, their participation, and, and they've brought people in. And so, uh, but we were just really committed to the brand and the concept of the event and making that work. And so uh, the first year, you know, we did go into it, and we said, look, we, you know, we want to make money on this, but the most important thing is everyone has a fantastic time because this has the ability to be really successful long term. So, uh, and it was, and it was a hit that night. And, and then we actually got approached by the, the Four Seasons in Baltimore more to move the event there because of what happened. And so it just was like all the right things started to happen. And so we've done a nice job of, we, we keep ourselves honest with continuing to tweak it, but everything relates back to the, the concept, which is really just to deliver a over the top experience. And, and like Max said, it's, it's, it's hard not to have a good time at this. And so now it's really, you know, people continue to ask us, you know, can we expand it? Uh, and truthfully, we, we've used it to launch into other things now. And so we're using the passion brand to build up other events. And I think that's important too, in that, look, we want to raise as much money as we can at that event, but we also want to be realistic with what can it do? And so I look at it from the numbers perspective, how many people we have in the room. I know what other events in Baltimore raise, like we're, we're pretty damn good at what we do. So, but we've used that success to go into other things now, and that's been really exciting. And so we're bringing sponsors in in other places where, truthfully, we can't even get them into passion now. And so, uh, but when we do have a table come up, I know that we have plenty of people on the waiting list. We have a question? Mm -hmm. What do you, how do you approach the business? What do you tell them as far as the sponsorship? So, so the question... Mm -hmm. So the question was, how do you first approach that business? What do you offer to them in return? How do you engage and identify those potential sponsors? Yeah, I think I use kind of like what's really worked when, when people sell to me, which is, you know, we, we sell on the, for, for that particular event, on the experience. And look, if you've got really important clients, uh, really important customers that you're looking to entertain in a u unique environment, this is a great place to do it. Uh, what I've found with that is it, it almost takes it out of that kind of charitable bucket that some sponsorships, you know, usually you kind of fit into one of these buckets, but it's almost like a client experience kind of thing that we've teed it up as. Uh, and that's really when, when we sit down and talk to some of these businesses trying to figure out what do they want to do and whether that's passion or other events. We've, we've launched another event off of passion using the same restaurants called Feastival. Uh, and what we do there is it's really about getting people out that haven't heard about CF before. And so we do that one in the summer. We do it outside. And so we approach businesses there and we're like, look, we, your sponsorship basically is going towards tickets to get people there. Uh, and so we sit down to really understand trying what they're trying to accomplish. Uh, but we're using the event like passion really to market it as, look, this is just a truly remarkable experience and something you, you, know, you can really entertain some important folks at. You know, clearly, if you have a decision maker that knows the cause, has a family member, has a friend that, that 
is, is affected by this, that, that's a no-brainer. But, but that's not frequent. Um, if you don't necessarily have an event like Passion, as Mac is talking about, the other strategy that tends to be successful is to sit down with that decision maker and say, hey, who do you want to get in front of? I mean, I, I can't, I've never met an entrepreneur that's not trying to grow their business. Who, who, who have you been trying to get in front of that you're trying to sell that you haven't had much luck with? Because when you strategically, randomly, quote unquote, put the seating chart together, and they happen to be sitting next to the person that they've been clamoring to get in front of for three or four years and haven't gotten that audience, all of a sudden you've created a, a raving fan and not only are they coming back to your event, but they're calling you asking you when the, when the next event on the schedule is because they know you're going to hook them up. Do we have other questions in the room? A couple? I will start here. So just to repeat the question for everyone, her, her question was, they come from a much smaller community that they're hitting up quite frequently with asks for other events. So she wants to know if there are any suggestions and recommendations for how to move forward and identify potential sponsors that may not be big banks or you know, big companies. Yeah, I think this is, this is something we struggle with too, even just with the number of events and how many times do we go to the well, right? And so, and how often are they hearing from us? I think one of the things we're trying to get better at now is organizing our ask and whatever level that is to think about, can you use multiple events to maybe increase the value for them? And so while they might not be a walker at great strides, but from a sponsorship standpoint, we're able to get a little bit more out of them because now they're at great strides and at the golf tournament and getting exposure. So we're really looking at things like that. And I think that works no matter what the level is. Uh, but, but to your point, I think that's being thoughtful about kind of, you know, sitting down with them again and going, what are you trying to get out of this? Uh, but I think that's really a, a way that we've certainly seen that we can move into that and be more thoughtful with people. I think another thing that's very key there is, is being strategic about who you're asking for what. So I know and in Charlotte, we have a lot of overlap, like you mentioned. So we have certain groups that are maybe off limits because we know that the biggest value that the breweries can bring is for our brewers ball. So for other events, we ask our volunteers not to hit the brewers or the breweries up. So it's, it's communication in your chapter, being strategic about where each of those potential sponsors can bring the most value and then, you know, going for it, going big for that one. So I think we've got time for one more question in this section. We'll, we'll have time for more questions later. I, I think I saw one back here. Did your question get answered? It, okay. So to repeat the question, she asked, how do you motivate your higher level executives who may be involved with the foundation to ask their peers or get their businesses involved um, and, and really encouraging people to, to make those asks? Yeah, I, I think that's it's, it's an art form there. There's, there's no scientific or prescriptive approach. What's great about the Maryland chapter is that, number one, the turnover within the professionals within the staff is, is minimal. So the people that have gotten to know the decision makers, the movers and shakers in town, and have gotten to know their tendencies. Um, and, and even if there's somebody that's emerged that's new that, that we want to work with, um, they, they're good at just asking a lot of questions and getting to know that person. There are some that the best approach is just to beat them over the head. Um, hey, to give me your client list. Um, what time tomorrow at 10 o'clock can I be at your office to make, help you make phone calls? Um, that's effective. There are others that that's going to turn, completely turn off. Um, it, it's really just individual, and I think the more you get to know who that person is, the, the more strategic you are, the more research you do about who you're approaching, the better. Um, it, it, you know, it's goofy as it is. You, you want to make sure you're, you've got the right person asking the sponsor. 
you may also want to know who the right person is to ask the person you want to ask to get to the sponsor. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'll just ask a quick question. How many in the room here have a personal tie to CF? How many do not? Look at the room. Look around the room. Think about what drives the people that do not have a personal connection to CF. For me, it was meeting a little girl with CF. And I will literally cut my wrist open and give her like anything she needs to help make sure that she continues to thrive. So it's about making personal connections with the people that you're asking for a sponsorship or that you're asking to volunteer and thinking about how you can continue to tie them to CF and make them want to be involved. So I, I, I would challenge all of you to think about either your personal connection and how you can share that with those that maybe don't have it. And then for those of you that don't have a personal connection, sharing that story. I mean, sometimes when I approach sponsors, I say, you know, I'm lucky to have not been touched by this disease. And so because of that, I want to make sure that nobody else has to be touched by this disease either. So I think that's, um, you know, you've got the higher level executives and the approach there, but there's also the hair salon that might give you a hair package that raises $100 on your event night. So from the smallest to the highest, every bit matters. So thank you so much, Mac and Mac, for that. We really appreciate it. All right. So we're going to move into the next part of our event. We are very excited to have Pam, um, who's very involved with the Minnesota Ga Gala. Gala? Apples, whatever. Um, so Pam is here today to talk to us a little bit about how you can add some fun elements to your themed events. So welcome. And we'll get you a microphone. There you go. Thank you so much. Um, what a privilege to be here and to just share some of the things that we've utilized um, with our Breath of Life Gala in Minnesota. Um, when uh, we first became involved, it was uh, 2001, our, our little guy was uh, diagnosed at five months of age and we dove in and have said yes everywhere that we're invited in um, to date. And that included um, kind of a restructuring of the chapter at the time and stepping into our Breath of Life Gala. Um, at the time it was a small event, about 100 people. And uh, the year before it had raised $14,000 and the year that we chaired it, honoring one of our health care providers, it was $25,000, which we thought was a huge win, almost doubled it. And then we had um, a, a great family move back to Minnesota who joined the committee um, because you know, it, to this point of sponsorship, that is the key to these black tie events, is to get in the corporate world involved. Because families, um, we only have so much to pour into this. It's all about our networks. And so what we did is... Um, Someone from the Mortensons family uh, business came back into Minnesota and sat down with us and said, you need to think big. We began planning in January um, for an end of November event and ramped up and we, we grew the event because of their involvement and sponsorship levels to $220,000. So we, you know, a thousand percent increase and got the attention of, of national and what are you guys doing to Minnesota? Well, it's all about people and making it a fun event. And it's been building and growing ever since. Uh, we did reach a million dollars in, in uh, two years ago. We did meet that threshold in one night. So it's a great group of people. And, and we do have kind of some secret sauce in Minnesota, I'm saying, we just do. Uh, the stories that we share, um, we used to do themed events, uh, which was fun and exciting and, and enticing. But as a committee, um, about six years ago, we decided to stop with all the fluff and the foof of the de decor, and every post, pillar, every table has photos of CF patients and their stories. Because as you all know, know, stories matter. Stories are the hook. Stories are things that people take home. And um, we do amazing fun things like uh, a, a rose wall where we get all these donations for live auction and, or silent auction items that we're not quite sure what to do and then little gift cards and things. We have this wall of roses and people can buy a rose and then there's something in there of value. Um, we uh, make sure that our sponsors are very well um, taken care of. They have VIP, re we've had VIP receptions in the past where they come and they get a private medical update. That's a huge attraction for some. Um, we have, um, we noticed the jump too in, in a large volume 
uptick was when we opened the bar. Um, we all know that the bar, when we open the bar, even here, um, things happen. <laughs> And so you can see that middle picture there, that, that martini luge is our, one of our signature events. We have um, one of our finest is an actual ice sculpture company. Who knew that existed? And they do a great martini luge for us. We have a signature martini every year. Everybody comes back and has to try the flavor of the year. So um, those kind of fun things, I mean, you can tap into and really expand on them and advertise them. Um, up in the top right there, that is our Bid for the Cure talk. We are always very intentional about who we uh, recruit to give that bid for a Cure talk. And it's someone local, someone's local story, um, very heartfelt. Um, that is a 15-year-old who had gone, undergone a lung transplant, very young. And the University of Minnesota uh, performed that at the adult center. And she is thriving now. She has her driver's license. She's uh, getting ready to graduate from high school. But her story, her family's story was featured. And uh, as you can imagine, uh, it was very successful bid that year. Um, we also have a couple of signature awards. Uh, we underwrite and sponsor everything, anything that we can sponsor we offer as an opportunity for companies to become involved in this. And we do have uh, a waiting list of people that want to sponsor things. Um, the Martini Luge is sponsored. The Martini is, or the, the, the vodka is a sponsorship. Um, we have sponsors for um, the VIP reception. We have places that people can, can put their name on and uh, not only bring tables full of people to spend money, but we've got spots all over that they can tap into. We had a Tesla car. It was a, an auction item for a week or a weekend, but it was just a fun thing that people can come and sit in a Tesla and see what it looks like and enjoy all these fun things that you wouldn't necessarily get to experience. We have a photographer there that also comes and everybody who's dressed up, you get a formal photo, it's sent to you free of charge as a thank you from the foundation. Um, just another little sweet touch that, that make people feel uh, important and valued and they're, uh, that we're grateful that they're spending their evening with us. Let's see. Um, we also have had um, uh, porcelain medallions that we've circulated throughout the uh, chapter to have kids with cystic fibrosis decorate and write thank you on and sign their first name and their age and then they go back to the chapter and we have volunteers throughout the room in the live auction and, and bid time that whoever wins the live auction item gets a medallion placed over their head and then also the bid for the cure. Um, so there's a little takeaway there and it's a little signature, you know, a, again, a, a touch point for people that they're making a difference and that their presence is valued and that these are kids that are depending on, on them and their participation. So it's a really good touch point. Um, let's see. Our final live auction item has always been a bouquet of 65 roses so that we can culminate the evening with this is, this is the story again story making a, a big difference in, in keeping people hooked. We have 400 to 600 silent auction items. It's a big job to gather all of those things and to do all, we have a basket, floofy, fluffy, fluffy thing at the chapter every year where people storm in and we have baskets lined in the whole office. It's um, a kind of a fire hazard, I think, but shh. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but just a whole lot of people coming together and putting together, um, using their talents, using their expertise to make this event um, such a signature event. Let's see, what else? We have celebrities. Um, we've had celebrity um, MCs come, a retired newscaster that everybody knows and loves, has fallen in love with cystic fibrosis and now is our, our signature MC. And so everybody comes to get a, a photo with Don Shelby. Um, so that's been kind of fun. We've had um, a celebrity uh, voice. There's a, a, a CF patient, uh, Sabrina Ness, who is very talented. She tried out and made the finals for, um, what's the one? Lou, help me out here. It wasn't the voice, that's the other. 
Thank you, American Idol. Yes, I should remember that. Um, but she came and performed, and that was a, another draw for people to see. Here's a, a child with cystic fibrosis who is able to belt it out and, and make some, some noise on the stage that was beautiful. Um, we always have dancing. Um, we have uh, also our awards are a signature event. We have that sponsored and underwritten. There's a, a family who lost their, their daughter to CF and um, have named the award. We have a, a friend award and we have a corporate award. And then we also now have a medical pioneer award named after Warren Warwick, who many of you know is a pioneer in, in cystic fibrosis care um, and uh, passed away a, a couple of years ago. So it's being creative, it's tapping into those things um, in your community that you know will be a draw, that people want to come to this event. We're a large market, we have all kinds of black tie events and it, there's several every weekend. And we are one of the premier ones that people definitely want to come back to and they want to make sure that they are seen at the Cystic Fibrosis Breath of Life Gala. Um, we're, we're moving into a new space because we need to grow. We've been tapped out at 700 people and now we, we're moving into a space that's larger. So um, we'll see what this year brings. Pam, talk to us a little bit about execution. You obviously have a great staff there mm -hmm. at your local chapter, but talk to us about your volunteer group, your committee, and how you execute and make these decisions versus the staff? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, great question. Uh, the, the staff is pretty efficient, and they have empowered the, the volunteers to, to again, uh, operate in their strengths and tap into their networks and ask those questions and, and um, bring to the committee what it is that they want to see this event happen. So choosing the theme, choosing how we're going to walk us out, choosing um, the awards. Um, it used to be the board would, would make the decision on who the award recipients are, but now the committee is so uh, robust and so well connected in all these different market segments that we're able to uh, determine the, the award recipients from, from that. So it's, it's pushing that down into more of the volunteer basis. Did I answer? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So how would you recommend someone to get started if they're on the other end of that, that funnel? Say they have an idea for, mm -hmm. for a gala and they want to kind of take that first step. Uh, I would start with your staff so they could tap into the resources, but then also um, start talking to your network, your circle of doing a, a small black tie event or a small formal event. Um, Lou and I actually spun off of the gala uh, to do something fun in our neighborhood. Uh, we have a, a great next door neighbor who wanted to do something for Dylan, our son. And so we had a, a wine tasting event and we live out in, you know, we have seven acres, we're in a woods, we're in a little tiny smaller community, but we had hundred dollar tickets. Everybody came in black ties and formals. We had valet parking. All of our teenage boys got to drive the cars, which <laughs> oh God. I know. <laughs> But um, we had, a, a, you know, sponsored locally, and, and it, it's a good grassroots start to it. Little auction, um, some, we put together a cookbook of fun flavors of appetizers um, and sold the cookbooks. And so in, in one evening, we raised $10,000. And it, it doesn't take a whole lot of um, people to pull that together. It's just the passion. Um, and it, that's the theme that's running through all the events, is that's something we've adapted. We no longer have a theme where uh, we, we decorate for a theme. It's just we have a passion for a cure, and we're all here under that one cause. That's right. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Do we have any questions in the room? Okay, I have one here. So the question was, with so many sponsors, how do you give them the proper recognition um, and encourage them to stay involved with your event? Um, it, it's basically a who's who. It's the construction industry. We're branching out into the financial market now, too. But um, it's, if you're not there, it's noticed. And if you don't renew your sponsorship, then your peers are calling you and asking you, what do you... Why are you bailing on cystic fibrosis? Um, but our sponsorship packets, um, they, we've, they've gone up each year. Um, $25,000 being a presenting sponsor, $10,000 for platinum, and then down onto a 65 roses. Uh, there's 
recognition in the program. There's recognition all over on the screens for the evening. Um, there's, uh, we have a website that we do for our gala and they're, they're advertised there. There's also tables that they're given at the different sponsorship levels so that they can bring their colleagues. Again, we're encouraging them to uh, create awareness, bring those clients, bring those vendors, bring those people that you want to bring into this circle. So there's, there's incentive. There's also there's a little friendly competition, I think, between industries. So it, that's a fun thing to set up, too. Mm -hmm. So I think at the other end of that funnel, if you're looking to get an event started, you know, it's, it's thinking about what the people that you're asking for would, would be interested in. So if it's a finest event, think about who would want access mm -hmm. to 10 or 20 of the best young professionals. Is it your local bank? Is it financial advisors? Is it home builders? Or, um, you know, you just got to think about that if it's golf. You know, one of the other people mentioned that they're targeting golfers or, you know, different local businesses that may appeal to those type of attendees. So, you know, even if you don't have that big following or if you're just getting started, you know, the worst people are going to do is say no. So just think through, you know, maybe make a, a target list and then kind of start, start there. So I think I saw another question over here and then we'll go here. So the question is, are you still using paper bidding or have you gone to mobile? We finally made the leap last year to go to mobile and um, mixed reviews, mm -hmm. mixed reviews. Um, we've got some, some older um, technology challenged that d didn't quite like it, and then there's those that loved it because they knew exactly where they were at financially. They had a budget of what they were going to bid, and they knew if they didn't win something, then they could make a bid for a cure or bid on a live auction. Right. You can see... Maybe, maybe that picture didn't make it, but there's a, a, we do have paper numbers specifically for the bid for the cure, just to make sure that we capture those um, and that it, it's just an impact to see all those numbers going up. Yeah. yeah. So I would say if you're interested in, in making that jump to mobile bidding, just make sure you're working with your staff. There are a lot of things that I would have never even considered that come into play with that. Obviously, we have access to that through the foundation, but there's things like extra fees at the hotel to bump up the wireless if everybody's going to be on their phone, like all kinds of different things. So if you're interested in that, just make sure you work with your, your local staff. Yeah. And then there was one over here. Yes, sir. So the question for the room is, for those that have chef events, are you having trouble engaging chefs if it's on a Saturday night? You know, what night do you target to have that kind of event when you're pulling chefs away on their busiest night of the week? Yeah, we do Thursday. Uh, Saturday would be a deal breaker for almost all 17, so they won that negotiation. Um, and, uh, but Thursday and then Festival we do Saturday afternoon, so it's at least off hours for them before Saturday night ramps up. And similar in Minnesota, we had a celebrated chef's event that was always on a Monday night because that's the, the night that restaurants are closed. And I think that's interesting. Our chef's event, we have on a Saturday, um, and it raises over half a million. So what I would suggest is when we break out into the groups, I would, I would put that out. I think it depends, you know, like he said, the chefs put a kibosh on Saturday night. It depends on, you know, what your market gives you. And if they're willing to put it together on a Thursday, then I'd say go for a Thursday. And did you have another one? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, so just to repeat the question, he asked about the rose wall that she was talking about earlier and um, wanted to know if there were other ideas and things in the room that you guys are seeing and doing. So I think that segues us perfectly into our table discussions. Um, what we're going to do now is break out into, we have some additional volunteers in the room, and we're going to break out into groups based on the type of event either that you already have, if you're looking for additional ideas for to share at the table, or if you have an event that's more aspirational and you just want to get more information. Uh, we have this group up here that's going to be moving around, and then we have some other volunteers in the room. So that is a great place to ask that question. When we come back together, we're going to have each table have one person stand up and give a, a finding or, or something awesome that they heard at their table. Um, so we will, I think we've got, I'll just hold this one up. So this one's uh, Gala's. And we'll have you guys separate based on where you have interest. So I will read that list. We've got galas. We also have golf events. And golf events is going to be with Hillary Smith. Where is Hillary? Oh, right here. So we'll do golf events in the front. Um, we also have finest events. We'll do that right up here. That's with Alan. We have Miss Pam, who is going to do the galas, which we just mentioned. We have food and wine events with Mac and Mac. Where do you guys want to go? Well, we can just have them kind of go in this back right. And then um, we already mentioned, oh, and Brewer's Ball. That's the one I missed. Where is Miss Terry? And back left with Terry for the Brewer's Ball events. So I'll read through that event again. We've got golf events in the front left. We've got finest events in the front right, which is my right, not yours. <laughs> in the back right, we have food and wine events with Mac and Mac. And then in the back left, we have Brewer's Ball with Miss Terry. We're going to give you guys about 20 minutes to have some discussion. So for those of you who are online, we are going to be going around to some of the different tables. We've got some breakout sessions happening for a discussion uh, based on the different types of events that you could possibly have at your own chapters. So you may hear some quiet, but we're going to go and see what we can find from table to table. So we're just stopping by the finest table, and they are talking a little bit about how to get a finest event started. So for those of you that may not have a finest event, it looks at engaging young professionals, either in a recognition type program or um, you know, maybe a silent auction type program, and thinking through your location, thinking through your selection process. Those are some of the things that are really key if you're trying to plan that kind of event. So the question was asked around a finest event, do you actually turn people away when you have a recognition type program? And the answer from the Charlotte chapter and from other chapters that we've seen has been yes. There is a specific nomination process and a specific selection process, and that helps to make it more of an exclusive type event. So another question that was asked around the finest event is what's the criteria? How do you go through the selection process? And I know for the Charlotte chapter, it's based on leadership, community involvement, um, business success. So we ask the different nominees to submit applications that can be vetted um, for other groups. It, it could be a different approach. Maybe it's based just on their CF involvement. Um, it just depends on your market. So right now we're talking about maybe other events that could qualify as a finest, not necessarily going through a selection process, but also thinking through how we can engage young professionals through fun events that they can get involved in. So one of the things that they are talking about now is how to engage the young professionals and make sure that they have a, a connection and a tie to CF if they were not aware of what cystic fibrosis was to to start. So thinking through, you know, maybe pairing them up with a local family or giving them a specific story that they can relate to and, and articulate when they're going to ask um, for sponsorships and involvement. So right now we're just talking a little bit about you know, how do we how do we get that started? What are some of the, the challenges? And so for some of the chapters, they have the same number of nominees and that's how many they decide to recognize because that's all they're getting. Um, so trying to think about how you can be strategic and uh, advance your program. Maybe it's starting small and, and making it more exclusive that way and then growing. Um, so I, I think it depends on your market and it depends on you know, your, your approach and what type of event it is um, as to how you, how you want to structure that. All right. We're going to go ahead and start wrapping it up, everyone. I know there's lots of good conversation, so I hate to, hate to cut it off.
Is there anything that anyone heard that they would maybe like to share with the group, some, an awesome idea or something that you're planning to take back to your chapter? Anybody want to volunteer? Maybe. No? <laughs> All right. Well, well we're, we're going to go ahead and break. We are moving into a 30-minute break, so I'll say again, thank you so much for attending. If I can have our key volunteers at each of the tables to raise your hands. I think we've got Alan up front, Pam, Mac and Mac, Miss Terry. If you want to hang out and chat a little bit, we do have a half hour break right now. So keep the collaboration going on and thank you guys so much for coming.